exactly the way you teach meditation um, different than how other people teach. Like right now, you've said things that I've not heard from other teachers about focusing on all these different places. I've heard people talk about focusing on the breath and the, a few things that I said before, but you've now brought up all these different objects of meditation. Is that how what you teach is different than what other people well, teach? Well, if I were to describe, I think first I'd want to emphasize how what I teach is similar to what the other people teach. Uh, uh, but of course we can all, you know, there's lumpers and there's splitters, right? The world is it's expansion and contraction. Am I asking to split or lump? All right, go ahead. Well, you asked me to split, split but yeah. uh, I would prefer to, to initially lump. lump, and then I'll split. Um, so the, um, I would say that, uh, well, I teach people to elevate their base level of concentration. So from that perspective, um, I would be identical to any other competent meditation teacher. Um, I work within the mindfulness tradition. Mindfulness can be called a kind of meditation if you want to, uh, in that it, one of the things that it does is uh, dramatically elevate your base level of concentration. But mindfulness has two other components, mindful awareness. Has, I, I think of mindful awareness as a um, threefold attentional skill set. So one of the components we've already talked about at some length, that's your base level of concentration power, mm -hmm. which I define as the ability to focus on what is deemed relevant at any given moment. However, in addition to that, which any form of meditation, mindful meditation or Christian centering prayer or TM, they would all achieve that. Mindfulness, in addition to that, has two other components or features that are strongly emphasized and are distinctive to it. Um, one is I call sensory clarity, which you can think of as the ability to keep track of the components of your sensory experience. Uh, for example, when to make that tangible when you're having a, um, an emotional experience. What part of that emotion is mental image? What part of that emotion is internal talk? What part of that emotion is uh, uh, emotional feelings in your body? If to keep track of the feel image talk components of emotion specifically and subjective experience in general, that would be an example of sensory clarity. Or to know when you have an external sound, the sound is one thing, your feel, image, talk, reactions to the sound are something else, and that it's those feel, image, talk, reactions that create the sense of an I listening to an it called the sound. To be able to keep track of what part is sound, what part is my reaction, what part is sight, what part is my reaction, Things like that are what I call sensory clarity. And we give people, just as we give people exercises that specifically develop their uh, concentration power, we also give people exercises that develop their sensory clarity. So that's, a, that's sort of distinctive to the mindfulness tradition. Then another thing that's distinctive to the mindfulness tradition is a conscious development of what we call equanimity, which is a little bit of a strange word. It's not ordinarily used. And in fact, that's why we use it, uh, to sort of give, sort <laughs> to of give, strange. Yeah. well, to, not to create an aura of mystical schmystical, but to give people a heads up, hey, this is a technical term, and it's it means something very specific, Pay and it's, it's defined in a certain way. Um, so equanimity sounds like being cooled out and detached, but actually, as we would define it in the mindfulness tradition, it's uh, radical non-interference with the natural flow of sensory experience. So if you have emotions in the body, you don't push them down, but you don't latch on to them inappropriately either. It's a sort of non-pushing and pulling, a hands-off, with regards to the flow of your senses, which does not for a moment imply a hands-off with regards to the flow of events in the world. You can, be very, you can be very proactive and even pushy with regards to circumstances and conditions, mm -hmm. 
but equanimity means that you're not pushing and pulling on uh, the natural operation of your senses. Your senses defined as external sight, external sound, physical type body sensations, ment your mental images, your internal talk, and your emotional body sensations. You let touch, sight, sound, feel, image, talk expand and contract as they wish without interference. Let me just make sure I, I get that right. So equanimity is my experience, thoughts and feelings and body sensation and how I'm experiencing the world in terms of sight and sound. I'm just l letting that happen and watching that kind of flow, I don't know, like waves or something, but that's separate from my wanting to do an action in the world to change things. Yes. In other words, as you become passive in a sense with regards to, in the sense that you, you're passive in the sense that you don't fight yourself. You're, you train, another way to look at equanimity is it's training your sensory circuits not to interfere with themselves. Um, so you could compare it to, um, uh, if your sensory experience is the engine of a car, equanimity is oiling the engine so the parts don't grind against each other. And causing that's being in the Tao, or that, that's that flow well, that we're well, it going can, for? It, it can lead to an experience of fluidity, but sometimes it can lead to an experience of solidity because you're willing to let things melt and freeze. There's another T.S. This is going to be T.S. Eliot time. There's another T.S. Eliot line. Um, <clears throat> uh, Midwinter spring is its own season. Between melting and freezing, the soul's sap quivers. You have to be willing to melt and freeze. Uh, the equanimity is equanimity with whatever form the uh, senses take. But what equanimity does is, uh, it's a skill. Um, yeah, so it's another way to look at it is, it's learning to love every sensory experience uh, as it arises, uh, but not to hold on to it uh, inappropriately as it passes. How do you develop that skill? I'd like that one. Um, everyone would, <laughs> because... That's a good skill. Yeah, it's a good skill. Let's all have some equanimity. Uh, I concur. <laughs> and why it's a good skill is you'll discover that when you have equanimity with pain, it still hurts, but it doesn't bother you. And when you have equanimity oh, with pleasure, it um, not only feels good, it satisfies you. People think they want to be free from pain and to have pleasure, but what they really want is to be free from pain being a problem and to have pleasure that gives satisfaction. And it turns out that the quality of equanimity does that. So when you say, yeah, I'd like... Yeah, you know, some of it's that, It's like please. that joke. It's like, I'd like to have what, <laughs> what she's having. having. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> what some of that. That's yeah, what I just that's said. Right. Yeah. Well, that's... <laughs> uh, the equanimity is definitely something. And how do you... That uh, people... Uh, desirable. Uh, highly desirable. And in fact, more than desirable may be absolutely essential. If you have some physical... Or emo and or emotional pain that cannot be gotten rid of by changing circumstances or by analgesia uh, or psychotropics or whatever, um, you, then you've got a choice of either developing equanimity or uh, being mired in ab abject suffering. So definitely equanimity is not only desirable, it may be uh, pivotal to making life worth living under certain circumstances.